Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Pastor Jack Hayford has penned more than three dozen books, over 600 hymns and choruses, including the internationally known Majesty. He is founding pastor of the 10,000 member church, The Church on the Way of Van Nuys, California. He's also founded the King's College and Seminary, the Jack W. Hayford School of Pastoral Nurture, Living Way Radio, and Spirit Form Television. What does it mean to have a heart for God? And how can we, as broken, sinful people, live up to the standard that God has set? God isn't interested in your perfection, but rather in your direction. Join Pastor Hayford as he digs into the scripture and explores what it means to have integrity of heart. Here is Pastor Jack Hayford. I need to tell you something you became liable to. Uh, probably when you began attending church. I learned this growing up in church. My parents received Christ when I was one year old. So I was raised in church, and I learned things about evangelical church culture. Uh, one of them is that if you have a, a visiting speaker, a guest evangelist, missionary, whatever, if they have a grandchild, they will tell grandchild stories. I use them for illustrations but it's actually compulsive behavior of grandparents. They cannot stop themselves. They, they tell stories about their grandchildren. And I, I learned two things about grandchild stories. The first thing I learned is that a grandchild story is only interesting to the person telling it. <laughs> the second thing I learned is that they think they're cute and funny when they tell the stories. I mean the stories about their kids. And you're obligated to laugh because they do, but it, they're not funny either. And they tell them in church. And in church, there's a certain courtesy you're obligated to show, so you act interested when you're not, laugh when you don't think it's funny, at least polite little chuckle. And uh, that's the reason these things have perpetuated and continue to survive. So when Anna and I were moving toward having our first grandchildren, I, I, I made a decision. I said, when we finally have grandkids, I am not going to tell grandchild stories. Church is a place where there should not even be the mildest form of hypocrisy imposed on people to respond. Why should they be forced to fake interest when it's not interesting and fake laughter when they don't think it's funny? So I said, I'm not gonna do this. However, <laughs> that was long before I discovered how incredibly cute and brilliant our grandchildren would be. <laughs> and so I tell grandchild stories now. But, but you need to understand this about my telling grandchild stories. I do not tell these stories for the cheap reason most grandparents do. <laughs> I told you it's compulsive to them. They can't control themselves. I want you to know I've got better control than that. I do not tell these stories because of a personal need. They're so great, it's for you that I do it. <laughs> So you're going to hear about Kyle right now. <laughs> Kyle, in fact, is the father of Anna's and my first two great-grandchildren. They've just been born in the last two years. And uh, uh, he was five years old when this took place. He's 26 now. And so this is, uh, took place when my mama was still alive. She went to heaven about 10 years ago, but this happened years before that. He was over at Mama's house, my mom, his great-grandmother. He was playing on the floor, and I didn't see this happen, but she told us about it. She reached over to help him do something, and when it happened, Kyle's playing on the floor, five-year-old little kid, hand came right under his eyes, and for the first time, he noticed the, his great-grandma's hand and had never noticed the hand of an elderly person before, pronounced veins, wrinkled skin, 
uh, bony fingers, just uh, very much like that one right there. <laughs> and uh, so when uh, Mama reached down, Kyle looked at her hand, and he's always been a very expressive kid. And even at five, he just, you know, he was really stunned. He, he just had, he shook, he looked very concerned. His great-grandma, what happened to your hand? And she just laughed, and she said, well, Kyle, nothing happened to great-grandma's hand. It's just old. And he said, how old are you? She said, well, great-grandma's 70. She chuckled again. Kyle looked at her then suspiciously. He said, 70. Did you start at one? <laughs> well, that story comes to mind for two reasons this morning. Because I want you to turn to number one book in the Bible. Go to Genesis there with me, if you will, chapter 20. Genesis 20, if you don't have your Bible, look on with somebody. If they have a Bible and don't share it with you, punch them out and take their Bible. And uh, chapter 20, the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, number one. But more than that, I want to start at one with regard to the, what I think is probably as foundational to anything of eventual, ongoing, durable, fruitfulness and effectiveness in life. Uh, it's not just in leadership, in life. But for a leader, especially a person like, I'm told 80% of the people in Breakforth Canada are people that have some role of influence in leading in their church. You're doing something, teaching little kids in the uh, preschool or in the, in the Christian school that's part of the church or working with young people or a youth sponsor or you're in, involved in licensed ministry as a vocational leader or as a, a person who is uh, bivocational and you hold leadership role in the church as well as carrying on the job you do. But we gather together and I essentially thinking in terms of people that lead and even if you don't hold a leadership role, I've learned this through years of leadership myself, that people who go to things like this are people who are really serious about what they're doing with their life for the Lord. So wherever you are, this is so basic. This that I'm talking about is named twice in the first six verses of the 20th chapter of Genesis. And I want to read that and then talk to you about this that I think is a start at one issue for all of us. First verse, 20, Genesis. From there, <clears throat> Abram journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abram said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, would you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister, and she herself said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. And therefore, I did not let you touch her. I want to talk to you about integrity of heart. I want to talk about the word integrity itself as it occurs in the Bible. I want to talk about three personalities in the scripture, beginning with Abimelech. And God comes to save his life. And that is probably so dynamic just in the principle that it establishes, but the key is not the principle of your life lasting in what it could be and what you've been given to do. He'd been given a realm of charge of leadership. He was king of what was a city-state. It would not have been a vast domain. Gerar was a city-state, and it probably, the number of inhabitants, we don't know but probably a community of something in the neighborhood of anywhere from 15 to 20, maybe 25,000. 
Abimelech did not have a sprawling kingdom, but he was a leader. And the Lord confronts him, and that confrontation is pregnant with significance for all of us, irrespective of our place in life. And those kind of things only become applicable in their significance when we pause to think that the issue is not just what was before him, but anything that's like that, something where you, you didn't know, but intuitively the Lord comes to deal with you and you feel what we sometimes say, a correction, an instruction, a prompting, a check in your spirit, that something of the Lord coming to say you're drawn back to recognize you really cannot successfully get away with that. And at first you wouldn't have thought of it. In fact, as Abimelech may have been innocent in your intentions, but nonetheless it was not an act of innocence. Which brings us to what he had done. In the world of that time, it was common practice. We're not saying this is God's moral standard, but it was commonly accepted within the, it was without taboos in the culture, that it was uh, acceptable for a king to take beautiful girls and to form a harem. So they had many wives, and they were there for his pleasure. And if it was not uncommon for a king, a tyrant, to kill a man in order to take his wife. Now with the, the husband out of the way, he could add her to his harem, which is the reason when Abraham and Sarah came in the area of Gerar, and it said sojourn there, it means they, they lived near there for a while and would do business within it. They were Bedouins or uh, travelers ongoingly, but they would remain in areas. And when they came to this site, the location near Gerar, that Abraham said, Sarah, say you're my sister because this king could kill me because you're a beautiful woman and he could do it for the sake of taking you for himself. And so Sarah agreed to it. And it seems peculiar to us that even a man would say that much less that the woman would agree. But at any rate, that was another culture, another time, and it's what happened. And so Abimelech uh, did, in fact, seeing this young maiden as he saw her being, beautiful woman, that she would be brought into the harem and she was, but the Bible says very clearly he had not taken her to himself yet. And so she simply was there in the harem. And the Lord comes to Abimelech. And he's doing this as protection to Abraham, protection to Sarah, and correction and instruction to Abimelech. And the meeting of the Lord with that man begins with words that are startling. It's enough to get your attention. When God comes in the darkness of the night and speaks to you and says, you're a dead man. And if that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what it's going to take, you know. You're a dead man. And he says, you've taken another man's wife. And Abimelech pleads his innocence. He said, I did not know this. He said, he said that she was his sister and she confirmed it, said he's my brother. It is in the innocence of my hands and the integrity of my heart that I did this. And the Lord said, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. That's why I'm here. Now, I want to come back to those words in just a few moments. But let me first establish the significance of this in the Scripture. And therefore, I think the significance in our thought life and patterns. Some of the basic rules for interpreting the Scripture include a statement or a, a, a rule that's called the law of first usage. And the law of first usage is that when you find a concept appear in the scriptures, that it the first time it occurs, it will establish a grid you can build on and that will be constantly the way it works through the Bible. And you can follow this idea even in places through the Bible where even the term integrity of heart doesn't occur that when something is clear to a person, they are accountable to that, whether they have a visitation from God or not, which is the main thing that occurs here. God visits Abimelech because he didn't see the situation clearly and it wasn't his fault. In fact, the flip side of that idea is that if Abimelech had known he'd taken a man's wife, God would not have showed up. He would have already known, and the sense of moral violation would have already been present. Now, this is not a message about moral purity, 
about not committing adultery or fornication. It obviously incorporates that because it's a part of our standard of life. It's a message about anything that I as a person am aware of in my own accountability to the Lord Jesus, his way in my life, the principles, concepts of his word for me, and when I hedge on them or don't understand the application of one to a situation, and when I don't understand it, the Lord will say, this, this applies to you here. And he will do that. In fact, I dare say there's not one of us in the room that have not had times that you had thought that everything was okay, and then there, there comes something that can be brought by as a result of a message you heard, a text, your devotional Bible reading of the Scriptures, hearing something, or just the impression of the Holy Spirit. A very common inclination of all of us is to have some stress between us and someone else. And they, they did me wrong. They talked about me. They neglected me. They, they were unfair and so forth. And so I legitimately have my complaint. And it isn't legitimate, however wrong they may be, that there comes a festering bitterness or irritation or criticism or the relaying to others about how that person tra treated you. But we feel justified. Even if we say no with nothing to anyone else, we feel justified in harboring something that is, in fact, unforgiveness. And we may not have a deep anger toward the person, but basically a wall has come between me and somebody else because of what they did. And if we have any ear to the Word of God, we know that as believers we are called to be as forgiving as we were forgiven. And we were forgiven by one who had done nothing wrong, and we had done it all wrong. And we're called to be as forgiving as he toward us. So the issue never is, is how unfair were they with me? But since I've been forgiven, notwithstanding I was the 100% wrong, I've been called to forgive even if another person who did me dirt or spoke unkindly or whatever they did, they were the 100% guilty party, at least as I see it. And that's just a simple illustration of the ease with which I can rationalize as a believer. Well, you know, I just, you know, I, I, I probably ought to let this go. But quite frankly, dear ones, we, we kind of like to pamper ourselves. We don't call it that. That would seem too childish. But we tolerate and endure. And that, again, is just another illustration. The morality that's inherent in this story is, would point to a thousand things we're all vulnerable to and temptation, uh, if, if not to outright violation, to things that creep into the mind are unworthy. But that's not the point of the message. The thing I talked about, relationships that get uh, hindered, obstructed, and jammed up tight and, and, and just fouled because of some stress, and then stay there for interminable amounts of time. Indeed, there are marriages that are ruined because of that very thing, Christian marriages, because of the unwillingness to just let our hearts be touched by the Holy Spirit who would come and say, not, I'm going to kill you, you're a dead man in terms of being stabbed through, but there are things that will die, like a marriage, like a relationship, like a dream, like the cutting edge of your ministry. One of the great, great things we all rejoice in today in the life of the church, and I constantly speak at worship conferences across the nation and around the world. And of course, this is more than just a worship conference, but we delight in worship today. Worship leaders today can be so taunted and tempted by the things that distract to where we don't even recognize it but the music begins to supplant the worship. It begins to be the definition of the worship, and that's what will happen to the people we lead. People say, wasn't that great worship? I just love that song. And it's wonderful to enjoy a song, memorize it, value it, and even to love it in the sense that we would love music. But at the bottom line, the objective, of course, is to get beyond the music and to have more than something that that turns me on and makes me excited and I exalt the Lord to where I encounter him and the worship is beginning to penetrate. It's one of the things I rejoice in every time I'm with Bob Fitz because it gets there. 
and you watch the pilgrimage we made in worship from some very bright and uh, rapidly paced songs to things that increasingly required thinking about the saturating grace that comes to us, the intoxicating beauty of just opening to him completely. You sang those words with me a few moments ago. Then he brought us to the place where there is a tenderness and an openness to the Lord. That's worship. And worship leaders can be caught in the trap of our skills. And I say that as a songwriter, composer, writer, leader of worship, instrumentalist myself. I understand that. The many ways that we lead, and there's the possibility of being caught in the trap of losing that cutting edge because we grow tone deaf to the Holy Spirit coming to say, I know you didn't mean to get there, but I'm here now. And when he comes to not rationalize or justify myself and say, well, you know, that's, that's right, and I'll, I'll work that out sometime, but to not let the death-dealing power of neglect of issues in my life bring the evaporation, the withering, the dying of things that might have been if I had walked in that correctability, teachability of the Lord's prompting as he brings things to my heart and mind. Integrity of heart. The word integrity is an interesting word. The word as it occurs in the scripture in the Hebrew is the word tom. In English, we would make the letters T-H-O-M, kind of run the <clears throat> whole word together, tom. And as the uh, word uh, in its basic meaning is something is complete. It's all there. I'm doing my hands this way because of something I'm going to illustrate with momentarily. But let me first say that this is inherent to our language and understanding. Integrity is related to words we use in other ways. Integrate. The word integrate has its base. Integrate, integrity. They're obviously cognate words. And integrate is to take pieces and bring it together into one. Disintegrate is the opposite. It begins to fractionalize. Just slices come off. So it's not all there. Integers, I-N-T-E-G-E-R. It's the word for whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five, instead of one-fourth, one-third, one-fifth. It's the whole thing. It's Integrity of heart has to do with what the Scripture says, Lord, with my whole heart have I sought thee. David says, Lord, unite or bring together my whole heart that I may reverence you. It's the wholeness of heart. When I was a little boy, uh, I, I used to, I really liked it. This seems so inane, but I got to tell you and confess it. When I was just a little boy, I was the oldest child, and I can remember uh, my mom saying, son, I need to make the lunches, and I don't have lunch meat. Run down to the corner store. There's just a tiny little mom-pop store down at the corner. Run down. She says, get me a dozen slices of and She'd say, four slices of bologna, four slices of salami, four slices of pimento loaf or whatever it was. And so <clears throat> I would go down to the store, and I, I really like this because now this is not, we're not talking supermarket, and we're not even talking a time that the meat was nicely packaged in a selection of slices, and you could pick it out pre-wrapped. But the guy would go over to a, a, a counter where there was things were kept cool, take out a loaf of whatever the meat was, turn on a machine, put it on there, and would just start slicing it. And that was the thing that was just so fascinating to me. I would lean over the counter, there was glass here, and lean over and just watch as he'd go, and this blade that is spinning at tremendous RPMs, just it would just lop off pieces of the loaf. Bloop, zoom, bloop, zoom. And I just, I, this, this sounds crazy, but to this day, that is cool. <laughs> I loved it. And I wish, I knew I couldn't do it. I'm just a kid, and this machine would probably slice your arm off if you gave it time. And, and I just, just loved that. But here's the point. You take one of those loaves, they were probably about 20 inches long, about 5 inches in diameter, and you put a loaf on there, and one slice, one slice, and it is no longer has integrity by the meaning of the word poem. And it's amazing in our lives how used we can become to just enduring just a few slices here and there, and it's still, and just you don't notice it that much. And another slice takes place. 
another compromise, another time that my mind wanders, that my eye wanders, that my attitude wanders, that I, I endure this, that, and the accumulation of things. I'm not talking, I'm not talking this morning about some rigid quest for holiness. It accomplishes that, but it isn't some religious snap the whip and everybody shape up or you're going to hell. That isn't the point. The point is the desire of the Lord to cause the life of his purpose in us, just as his purpose was to spare the life of Abimelech so he would not... Con the point wasn't that man, the man would become a dead man. God's saying, I'm waiting for a chance to do you in. It's God saying, you've got a realm to rule and a life to live and fulfillment to realize, and I don't want you to miss it. And God's desire for our integrity of heart is not to rise to accomplish a standard, but to be accountable to those things that will release our life to maximum fruitfulness, what we were made to be. And the beauty of the heart of God is seen in this text, and it's illustrated in two other things, both in its functionality and in the things that will drain it off by my mention of two more people, and I'm nearly done. I say that because people like to hear you say that. That's uh, you say. You say, I'm, I'm nearly done, and everybody kind of takes hope. You know. <laughs> when you come to David, who we know was a tremendously dynamic warrior and worshiper, kind of the basic picture of what we're called to today, spiritual warfare and the worship of the living God, and from his presence draw the power and the confidence and the capacity to move in the power of his spirit and the light of his word and to overcome the darkness around us and to reach and bring people out of it. And he extended the boundaries of Israel as far as they ever went. He was the most successful accomplished warrior in the history of the nation and the most prominent worshiper who today to this day we still sing songs he wrote under the touch of the Holy Spirit notwithstanding David's later failure and then the repentance that brought him back into warm fellowship with God, notwithstanding that, the basic trait of David are those two things. At a time his life was just constant in understanding of who he was, David said, Lord, my enemies, 25th Psalm says this toward the end of the Psalm, my enemies would swallow me up. And he was talking about these boundaries that had been extended to the point that neighboring nations would like to encroach on the boundaries and come back in retaliation or come back and conquer him. And David said, my enemies would swallow me, swallow me up. And then he says this, but Lord, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. Here's what he's saying. Lord, the boundaries are so broad, there's no way I have enough troops to patrol all the boundaries and guard every entry point of the enemy but I will walk before you in integrity and trust you to give me caution, direction, at any point of intrusion may begin to crowd in on the nation you've given me to lead. In other words, he was appealing to the very thing you see elsewhere in the Bible where a prophet would come and speak to the leadership and say the enemy's coming from this direction. David's case, the Lord told him, the Philistines are coming here as they come says, you meet at such a location and wait till the wind blows in the trees and that's your signal I'm giving you to attack. God was a protector director. And David says, it's my heart before you that I'm counting on to be the means by which I protect what you have given me to serve and to oversee. My enemies would swallow me up. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. The principle applies to everybody in this room the realm of your duty, charge, responsibility, if there's any point that there would be even the most subtle encroachment of the adversary upon your life, your thought, even things as with Abimelech you don't even know are happening, God by his Holy Spirit is committed to the preservation of your integrity, but there has to be a will of the heart to want it and a will of the heart to act upon the corrections when the Lord gives them. Solomon, when he inherited the king of his father, Solomon said, Lord, I ask you to perpetuate. He was on a prayer, a platform higher than this stage here in front of thousands and tens of thousands of the people of Israel that had gathered 
for the coronation of the king. And he knelt before them in his regal robes, the king humbled before God and lifted his hands and he prays for God to perpetuate the kingdom that it, he'd inherited from his father David. And the Lord met Solomon right after that in a nighttime visitation. And he said, Solomon, I will perpetuate the kingdom that I gave your father David if you will walk before me in integrity of heart. And there that phrase occurs again. Solomon began that way. Many of the Proverbs are born out of the wisdom he learned during the time of his obedience. But with the passage of time, Solomon, rather than depending upon the Lord for the guarding of the borders, began to negotiate treaties with neighboring nations. You can read about it in the scripture. And every time he negotiated a treaty so that a treaty, rather than dependence upon God, was the means by which he would preserve the boundaries, the was, treaty was sealed by the marriage of a princess from that country, and Solomon was accumulating wives. And every time that a wife came from that na nation, out of political correctness, she was allowed to bring the God of the neighboring nation, and there would be idols began to line the streets of Jerusalem until the time beyond Solomon's life, but it started then, those gods would actually crowd the worship of God out of the nation. And it didn't start by one massive decision. It started one, one alliance at a time. Integrity of heart. Integrity of heart is something that is on the basis of my availability to be guarded by the grace of God and to respond to that grace whenever anything would attempt to snake in to my life. I want to conclude by telling you a story of when I was 10 years old. I just finished breakfast, come out of the breakfast room, started through the kitchen. Mama was over there working on some things, her back to me looking out the window there. I was on my way through the room, and I was going through the den up to the stairs and going to go on upstairs, get my things, go to school. And I just got halfway in the kitchen, and Mama called, says, Jack, wait just a minute. And when I stopped and Look back at her, just standing like this. She said, son, she's there drying her hands. She said, son, I want to uh, ask you a question before you go to school. And she said, but I want to ask you in front of Jesus. Now, whenever mama said those words, you need to understand two things. The atmosphere of our home, you would not call religious, but it, we, we took the Lord seriously. I was raised by parents who raised us kids to, to know and love the Lord, but you didn't live in some kind of a, a grid of legalism, but it was just a warm sense of the reality of God. And whenever Mama uh, had anything to ask, or she thought we might be tempted in answering to fudge on the truth, she would say, I want to ask this in front of Jesus. And it meant that we are consciously answering in the presence of the incarnate truth, the Son of God. And when she said that, I was just through, I turned around and said, when she said that, I, I turned and stood just feeling very sobered, in fact, a little uneasy because I knew this was a serious moment and I didn't know what she was going to ask. She said, yesterday when you came home from Billy's, she said, I really felt something uncomfortable inside me and I didn't know what it was. And she said, I decided just to pray and this morning I asked the Lord what to do about what I felt because I still felt it this morning. Jack, in front of Jesus, what happened at Billy's yesterday? Well, Mama, uh, we were we were playing in the in the front room, and uh, Billy Billy said uh, asked me to come in his room, and he said he wanted to show me something. And we went in there, and he opened the drawer, and reached way back in, and there, he, Mama, there was this little kind of telescope. But when you look in it, it wasn't a telescope. There's, when you looked in it, there was a, a naked woman. Well, son, how did you feel? 
I, I felt bad. Well, what did you do? Well, I, I laughed. Son, what do you want to do now? I said, Mama, I, I want to pray. And we did. I don't have any idea what that moment may have headed off, not only at that time of my life, but to what degree it contributed towards something that I thank God for being uh, initiated as a child into recognizing that when there comes a correction of the Lord, it really isn't an optional thing if you at all believe Jesus is Lord. And if I have any key that I have for people to really live a liberated, dynamic, joyous and effective life, where the word of God becomes more than letters and laws, but it becomes dynamic and joy and spirit, becomes power in you by the breath of the spirit through the truth of the word, and you know fruitfulness and fulfillment at every dimension. If I were to say one thing that was key to it, having come to Christ, it would be this, to walk in integrity of heart, and you do that by living your life in front of Jesus. I'd like to pray with you as we conclude this morning. Could I ask that you close your eyes, but lift your head. Just open your hands in front of you in the posture of availability. I want to pray and I'd like to lead you in a prayer. When I do, speak out boldly. Father, first I pray for my friends and fellow believers and servants of yours and pray you take your word and by your spirit cause it to become refreshing and life-giving and infused with truth that abides and is incarnated in our living. Would you pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I open myself, gratitude for the joy of salvation, but with a hunger for the power of a life lived in front of Jesus, where integrity of heart liberates the maximum of life, removes the death-dealing power and brings abiding fruitfulness through Jesus Christ, my Lord. As that's your prayer from all your heart, say a strong amen. Amen, and God bless you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God. Mm -hmm.